So this lecture has to do with different examples of enzyme inhibition. So it sort of supplements the previous lecture that introduced the concept of enzymatic inhibitors. So just as a review, uh, we want to realize that what we see here is the Michaelis plot. It is a graph of V on the y-axis, reaction velocity. And on the x-axis, we have substrate concentration. Remember the steady state hypothesis, enzyme plus substrate goes to enzyme substrate complex, which breaks down to E plus P. So under the steady state hypothesis, the Michaelis plot looks like this uh, for different enzymes. And what's important here is K sub M, which is the substrate concentration where V is equal to V max over two. Now we are interested in actually attaining V max, which is this asymptotic region here for the blue graph as well as the red graph. Uh, and we're also interested in Km, right, where the substrate concentration where V is equal to V max over two. So those are two parameters that are of interest. So in order to do that, we do a double reciprocal plot. This is also known as the line weaver book plot. We take the reciprocal of the y-axis and the reciprocal of the x-axis, and you get a line. So it's a linear transform. Uh, with the equation y is equal to mx plus b. So y is equal to mx plus b. Your slope is km over v max, and then your intercept is 1 over v max. So that gives you a line. The y-intercept is 1 over v max. The x-intercept is minus 1 over km. To get the true v max, you just take the reciprocal here. To get the true km, you have to get the negative reciprocal of the x-intercept, the point on this x-y graph that intersects the x-axis. And here's the equation. We call this the Michaelis-Menten equation. That describes this, uh, the equation that describes the shape of the graph. So rather difficult equation for us to extrapolate Vmax and Km, uh, turning it into a line, the so-called line weaver burke plot, the linear transform, makes it easy for us to extract Vmax and Km. So now we're going to introduce this concept of inhibition. So this is um, a lot of these examples that you see here are examples that you may have seen in the mainstream, you know, like going to the pharmacy or common drugs that you have probably heard about. So here's our original steady state equation. We will alter that by adding inhibitors. So the three different types of inhibitors that I will focus on in this lecture are competitive, uncompetitive, and then pure non-competitive inhibition. So in competition to the straight horizontal line, we're going to add a, a, another detractor. And the de, uh, the uh, competition is from here, okay, the so-called competitive inhibitor. So a competitive inhibitor will bind to the active site in the same way competing for the active site of the substrate. So you have a substrate, you have an inhibitor, they're competing for the active site of the enzyme. Now, the problem is if the inhibitor gets into the enzyme, you have the EI uh, complex, which produces no reaction. So essentially, you've halted temporarily the activity of the enzyme. The nature of this inhibition really stems across the dissociation constant. Your textbook calls this KI. It can also be called KD. The subscript does not matter. But the dissociation constant if a high dissociation constant, if that value is very high, then this will dissociate to free enzyme and free inhibitor. If the dissociation constant is low, that means EI is more likely to be stuck in that configuration, favoring uh, the competitive inhibition. Some examples that you see here of competitive inhibition, there are many. Uh, succinate to fumarate is one of the reactions of the TCA cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is succinate dehydrogenase. Well, it turns out in the active site of succinate dehydrogenase, it can also accommodate malinate. But it, when it accommodates malinate, you get no reaction. So malinate, we say, is a competitive inhibitor of succinate. Now take a look at the structure form of succinate versus the structure of malinate. They look alike. That's one stereotypical feature of competitive inhibitors, features that because they bind to the active set of the enzyme, they often look alike, okay, structurally speaking. Several types of competitive inhibitors, uh, the amino acid, the glutamate, this is oxaloacetate that's important in amino acid metabolism, also important in glucose metabolism, uh, oxalate, um, 
malinate, and then the actual cognate substrate, succinate. So these four here, glutamate, uh, oxaloacetate, oxalate, and malinate, actually competitive in it, competitively inhibit binding to the native substrate succinate. So in a Michaelis plot, a competitive inhibition will actually depress or flatten this uh, curve here. Uh, this is a hyperbolic curve with an asymptote that is Vmax. Now the degree of this depression really depends on this modulator known as alpha. The alpha modulator has this formula 1 plus inhibitor concentration over Ki. This fraction really determines to what extent and to what level this plot goes down so that you have a depression uh, in the overall curve. And so the idea is very simple. Uh, if you have a higher concentration of inhibitor, obviously you will decrease the uh, hyperbolic curve. Another part here is the dissociation constant. So if the dissociation constant is very high, that means that this EI complex tends to dissociate. So if you couple these two factors, okay, a high dissociation constant, which means the EI complex will dissociate better, a higher concentration of inhibitor, so a high value of I, a high value of Ki, both serve to really enhance or elevate this fraction. So elevating this fraction actually elevates alpha and then further gives you more competitive inhibition. So first and foremost, uh, anytime you add an inhibitor, uh, the curve, this line rotates and it rotates in a counterclockwise manner. And the degree of that counterclockwise rotation of the line depends upon the alpha modulator, which has this formula. This feature of uh, competitive inhibition is this uh, common intersection point. So that common intersection point is 1 over Vmax. It stays the same. It stays the same no matter how much competitive inhibitor you have. Also, another feature here is minus 1 over Km. So taking the neg negative reciprocal of that, you'll find that the apparent Km value actually will go up. Here, taking the reciprocal of 1 over Vmax, the common intersection point, the Vmax stays the same. I should say the apparent Vmax stays the same. So one of the features of a competitive inhibitor, the apparent Vmax stays the same, the apparent Km goes up. So that is something that is um, a hallmark of competitive inhibitors. So, so you may wonder why the apparent Vmax is the, the same. So why does it not change if you have a competitive inhibitor? Uh, the reasoning behind this is just brute force. So if you increase the uh, substrate concentration, you actually outcompete and dilute out the inhibitor. So more substrate, overwhelming the system, the inhibitor gets diluted out. Just probability alone, the substrate will bind to the active site as opposed to the inhibitor. So you can achieve Vmax. Uh, v apparent max can achieve Vmax. All you got to do is really bump up the substrate concentration. So in that regard, the apparent Vmax and the Vmax are the same. Only you have to significantly and significantly increase the substrate concentration to com out compete to dilute out the competitive inhibitor. Likewise, the apparent KM is going to go up because it takes now more substrate concentration to achieve the coveted Vmax over 2. Examples of competitive inhibition. So this is a very famous example, uh, something that uh, in my life class students get a kick out of it. So uh, there's a disease called methanol poisoning or methanol toxicity. It leads to blindness. Um, the comes from this, alcohol dehydrogenase, which normally converts ethanol to acetylaldehyde. So this is naturally found in our body, and it's going to convert this enzyme. Alcohol dehydrogenase is going to convert ethanol, this primary alcohol, to this aldehyde. It's a way of metabolism of that molecule. Well, um, for some reason, um, a lot of people who happen to drink maybe some adulterated alcohol or moonshine, a lot of rural places. Um, some of that alcohol has methanol instead of ethanol. Well, what happens then is that if you drink tainted alcohol, the methanol will actually bind to the alcohol dehydrogenase. It will bind to its active site. Instead of the ethanol, the methanol will bind 
and you'll get this product formaldehyde. So methanol is the actual competitive inhibitor of ethanol in binding to the active site. They actually look alike if you look at the structure. Okay, the substrates look alike. But with methanol binds, you get formaldehyde. Now, this is a toxic metabolite. It leads to blindness. So in cases and situations where there is methanol poisoning and methanol toxicity and blindness, uh, there's a way to treat it. And the proper treatment for methanol poisoning is, well, what did we learn from competitive inhibition and how to overcome the competitive inhibitor? Well, the treatment for methanol blindness from drinking tainted or maybe cheap alcohol is to saturate your system with ethanol. So the idea being bumping up or significantly enhancing the concentration of ethanol into your system dilutes out effectively the methanol, more ethanol gets into the active site, washes out the methanol, the ethanol gets converted to acetaldehyde, the methanol, which has been sort of diluted out, outcompeted away, uh, has no chance to be converted to the toxic formaldehyde. For some of the mainstream articles from different websites, so can you really drink yourself blind? I've attached a link here and you can check that out. So, um, you know, a lot, lot of these stories maybe uh, are funny in some cases, uh, but then you do see that people do pass away. There's casualties from methanol blindness. And again, pr primarily reason, primary reason is uh, moonshine or contaminated alcohol that contains more methanol than ethanol. How about this article here? Again, this is just, you know, perusing the Websites, you can find a lot of these on the web. Uh, Whiskey Cures a Man Who Went Blind from Vodka. I believe in this story, they actually get, um, gave an IV. Um, another funny story, doctor saved a man's life by pumping 15 cans of beer into his body. And then um, I think this was a person from Vietnam. A lot of these stories are there. You can derive humor from them. But also there's a lot of casualties as well. Again, drinking you know, very poor quality ethanol that has large amounts of methanol in it. So other examples of competitive inhibitors. Uh, methotextrate is a competitive inhibitor of dihydrofolate reductase. It's often as a tr treatment, common treatment for cancers, particularly um, AML, uh, amyloid myeloid, or excuse me, acute myeloid leukemia, CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. The way this works is by um, targeting dihydrofolate reductase. So dihydrofolate reductase, certain cancers gets pumped up and methotextrate, methotextrate um, is a synthetic chemotherapeutic drug that um, sort of binds to dihydrofolate reductase and shuts off this enzyme. So here's the competitive inhibitor. Here is the natural substrate. For that enzyme, you can see, again, the similarities. Common theme here I want uh, you guys to realize is structural similarities between the competitive inhibitor and the cognate substrate. Problem with met uh, methotrexate and, or problem is that it will also attack normal cells besides the cancer cells. And the rationale being the cancer cells are proliferating more rapidly, so more likely this drug is going to attack the cancer cells. Unfortunate bystanders would be the normally replicating cells, the normal cells. So uh, sulfinamides are a class of antibiotics called the sulfur drugs, competitive inhibitors of a pathway for bacteria to make folic acid. So here's the actual folate that bacteria use, and then uh, different derivatives. Again, uh, notice the structural similarity between the competitive inhibitor and the cognate substrate. One thing I can tell you about the sulfa drugs, they're essentially harmless to humans. Why is that? Um, so we can take a sulfa drug and we really don't have to worry about the sulfa drug killing our normal cells. These drugs target folic acid that bacteria produce. Humans okay, uh, get our folic acid from the diet. So without a metabolic pathway, uh, to produce folic acid, humans taking it from the diet don't have to worry about a antibiotic that's going to target folic acid synthesis because we get our folic acid from our food. The only really worrying point here is the resistance, antibiotic resistance to the sulfa drugs. 
Other inhibitors that are competitive in nature, the Avir drugs, or Tanovir is the common one. These are competitive inhibitors of the HIV protease, which is one of the proteases in HIV that cuts other proteins, activating the proteins so that it could target the T cells. And um, the ritanavirs, there's also above, uh, other types of class of drugs. They end in AVIR, the Avir drugs, also are competitive inhibitors. So here's the structure of this. Notice the peptide bonds. So this binds to the protease, locks it in, and the real substrate cannot bind. And you've got in a way to sort of inactivate or deactivate the HIV protease from doing its life process. Type of drugs here, sedanafil. This actually goes by the commercial uh, name Viagra, and this is its structure, and it's a competitive inhibitor of this enzyme cyclic GMP 5 phosphodiesterase. So here is the substrate, here's the Viagra molecule, and um, what this does is um, promotes vasodilation, and um, here's the competitive inhibitor of that drug. Okay, so this actually knocks out vasodilation, cyclic GMP phosphodiesterase. Um, this blocks this enzyme. You have enhanced vasodilation. All right, another type of competitive inhibitor, statins. Again, this is a whole family of drugs, and they inhibit the pathway to make cholesterol. So our body can biosynthesize cholesterol. It biosynthesizes it from two molecules of acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is actually part of the TCA cycle, and acetyl-CoA is how your body synthesizes fatty acids. If you remember the fatty acid lectures, our body synthesizes them uh, acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA at a time. So it also takes those acetyl-CoAs and in a, another pathway makes cholesterol. Well, the statin drugs actually bind and are competitive inhibitors at this step. This is an important enzyme. It's sort of the enzyme that commits it uh, towards cholesterol biosynthesis. The enzyme is HMG-CoA synthase, hydroxymethyl um, glutaryl coenzyme synthase, something you do not need to know other than the statins inhibit one of the first and initial enzymes in making um, cholesterol. So the idea being the statin family of drugs can be used as treatments to lower cholesterol. Probably there's a lot of liver toxicity. Probably there's a lot of bad side effects. Um, for that, you know, you can read a lot of the clinical papers. All right, let's talk about uncompetitive inhibition now. So the uncompetitive inhibitor binds at this step. The enzyme substrate complex, you get ESI. Okay, of, of enzyme substrate inhibitor, this uh, Ternary complex leads to no reaction. Again, notice the dissociation constant. We're going to call it Ki prime. You can also call it K prime D. And again, a high dissociation constant. If that number, the magnitude of that number is high, then more likely this will dissociate and then you will resume the steady state um, equation. If that dissociation constant is low, a low number, a low magnitude of the dissociation constant, ES plus I will tend to stay more locked in the ESI form, leading to the uncompetitive inhibitor not producing the reaction. So uncompetitive inhibition, um, classic case here of parallel lines. So this is what I tell students, parallel, parallel lines, you want to associate that with uncompetitive inhibition. So that's very important. Now what's happening to a parent KM and a parent VMAX? So our apparent VMAX has gone up here. So our apparent VMAX, so here is without the inhibitor. Here is uh, with an inhibitor. And here is with uh, maybe a different inhibitor that's more inhibitory or maybe more concentration of the same inhibitor. Um, but this is one over our apparent VMAX. So we got to take the reciprocal now because it's a double reciprocal plot. Um, so 1 over Vmax here, 1 over apparent Vmax, take the reciprocal, 1 over apparent Vmax, take the reciprocal, the apparent Vmax decreases. While we can appreciate the apparent Vmax decreases as we go 
and take the negative reciprocal of the x-axis to get apparent Km, we'll also find that the apparent Km also decreases. So the apparent, apparent Km decreases, the apparent Vmax decreases as well. So the apparent Vmax decrease kind of makes sense if you're having an uncompetitive inhibitor. Um, really, you're kind of stuck here, okay? You cannot outcompete it away as opposed to an uncompetitive inhibitor where you can sort of compete it away. Okay, an uncompetitive inhibitor, by its very nature, you cannot compete it out. You cannot dilute it out. You cannot sort of, quote unquote, wash it away because it just produces this unproductive ternary complex. Now, why does the apparent Km decrease? Uh, well, that implies that it takes less substrate concentration to achieve Vmax over two. First of all, two points here. The first point is we're talk, talking about apparent Km. We're not talking about actual Km sans the presence of an inhibitor. So we're talking about apparent Km. Second point I want to, uh, if you lower the substrate concentration, uh, actually you are preventing the formation of ESI. So by lowering the substrate concentration, essentially what you're doing is um, you're forcing the reaction away from ESI and then more towards ES, more specifically towards E plus P. This is more of an issue of Le Chatier's principle. So lowering the uh, substrate concentration essentially it's a preventative measure of getting ESI. So it's going to take less substrate concentration to achieve Vmax over 2 simply by the fact that you're preventing the formation of ESI. Examples of this uh, oxalate by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. So do not know if we'll have time to go over this, uh, those of you taking the online version of the class. Uh, but lactate dehydrogenase converts pyruvate to lactate, uh, something your body does during enormous, enormous exercise. It converts pyruvate to lactic acid. Um, so lead is an uncompetitive inhibitor. And the one that I'm going to be of uh, heme synthetase, one of the enzymes in the pathway to make heme, the group that is uh, involved in coordinating iron and hemoglobin, I want to mention a little bit more about this third point here, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. So the uncompetitive inhibitor of this is this molecule known as arsenate. So we will go through this reaction when we talk about glycolysis. This is one of the steps in the 10-step pathway to metabolize glucose. And in this reaction, in this pathway, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate gets converted to 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. And in that process, uh, you require three substrates here. You require glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, you require NAD+, and then you also require inorganic phosphate, okay, also known as phosphate. So with those three substrates in place, they'll go to the important site on this enzyme's active site, and you get the product 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. So that's well and good under the normal situation. However, uh, an uncompetitive inhibitor of this inorganic phosphate will be arsenate. So what happens is that the enzyme will bind. So this is a ping, 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 pong, pong type of reaction. So uh, the ping, 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 that third substrate is the inorganic phosphate normally. Uh, in arsenate poisoning, uh, the arsenate is going to bind instead of the inorganic phosphate. So a classic example of uncompetitive inhibitor. The uncompetitive inhibitor, in this case arsenate, is binding to an enzyme substrate complex that contains already the substrates NAD plus and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So as a result, the enzyme really halts. The enzyme is done. Uh, you don't get uh, the products, the correct product here, which is 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, and you don't get the correct product here, which is the reduced cofactor NADH. Really, in essence, uh, glycolysis halts, and it's going to halt at this step. All sorts of perverse manifestations occur, uh, but one of the things that happens in arsenic poisoning is not only you lose the capability to make uh, or metabolize glucose, uh, but uh, one of the features of arsenic poisoning okay, in this uncompetitive inhibitor of this enzyme uh, is that you're going to get um, these uh, sort of blackened 
types of pustules and nodules, and uh, it's called keratosis, particularly on the uh, extremities. By extremities, we mean the fingers and the feet. This is the clinical side of, of arsenate poisoning. Typically, this is found in well water. A well water, people who drink um, from wells, uh, that has been laced with arsenate, uh, will have arsenate poisoning, and this is one of the features of that. All right, our final inhibition is one that inhibits competitively, at the same time inhibits uncompetitively. And we're going to call that mixed inhibition. And specifically, uh, mixed inhibition, we're going to talk about a situation called non-competitive inhibition. So taking uh, the easiest of the routes here in terms of mixed inhibition, uh, we're going to say the inhibitor binds with equal propensity to both the enzyme and the enzyme substrate. Okay, So by saying it binds with equal propensity, uh, what we're saying is that their dissociation constants are equal. So the dissociation constant EI dissociating back to free E and I will be the same as the dissociation constant of ESI dissociating back to free I and free ES. When that happens, and only when that happens, you get pure non-competitive inhibition. It's a very simple way of looking at it because it really simplifies our line weaver burp plot. And the simplification of the line weaver burp plot is right here. Okay, we have a common x-intercept. So the apparent Km is going to equal to the Km when you do the negative reciprocal. So what happens to the apparent Vmax? Okay, the apparent Vmax is going to decrease. Remember, we're taking the reciprocal here to get the apparent Vmax. So the apparent Vmax is going to decrease. The apparent Km is going to stay the same. That is only if you have non-competitive inhibition. That is only where the dissociation constants for both of those uh, inhibitor to the substrate and inhibitor. That is only when the dissociation constants are equal. So just as you are going to dissociate, you will associate. When this happens at the same rate, that is pure non-competitive inhibition. When this happens at an unequal rate, the dissociation constants are different, uh, then you have mixed inhibition and you no longer have um, the common x-intercept. So here's some different examples of non-competitive uh, inhibitors, something you can definitely look at uh, in the PowerPoint notes. Uh, notes, uh, no, uh, the uh, ACE inhibitors, um, here's an enzyme here, ferrochelatase. We do generally have examples of non-competitive inhibitors. This is the perfect case, once again, the perfect case where the dissociation between the free inhibitor to the enzyme is the same as the free inhibitor to the enzyme substrate complex. I'm going to throw this in here because what happens is we do not have the perfect case uh, where the dissociation constants are not equal. Okay, so we have an uneven dissociation. Right. If we have an uneven dissociation, the intersection point is right here in the second quadrant. All right, this is kind of the same as the previous slide. Um, again, we're looking at the situation. My emphasis is going to be at the situation where um, there's a common X axis point and the common x axis point once again is where the dissociation constants are the same between E and E and S to the inhibitor. Right, so here's a situation where you notice here how all the um, apparent KMs and apparent Vmaxes, alpha now, this modulator plays an important role. It gets very complicated pretty fast when you're dealing with a mixed inhibitor. Right? So if you're more along the intersection point along the x-axis, um, you tend to be um, more uncompetitive in nature. If your intersection point is more towards the y-axis, you tend to be more competitive as an inhibitor. Examples of mixed inhibition, uh, plenty of them in the literature. A lot of poisons are there. Uh, cyanide and azide are mixed inhibitors of enzymes that require the metal cofactors iron and copper. A lot of um, proteins in the electron transport chain, those complexes contain iron and copper. So cyanide definitely is a potent inhibitor of some of the electron transport chain complexes. And um, this drug here is a mixed inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic anhydrase, there's 12 different isoforms of this enzyme. 
And uh, we learned that in uh, our hemoglobin lesson, talking about how this enzyme is important in blood buffering. Touch base briefly on suicide inhibitors. Uh, these are inhibitors that make the enzyme die. All right, so that dissociation constant for other inhibitors, competitive, uncompetitive, and here and non-competitive, uh, we rely upon the dissociation constant to keep the steady state reaction going. Uh, here, the enzyme is completely de dead. It's inactivated. What happens usually is um, the drug or the compound makes a covalent attachment, an actual covalent attachment to some active site or an important active site amino acid residue. And when that's done, uh, the enzyme can't do any more cycles because it's blocked, okay? It's literally blocked by a covalent bond. COX-1 and COX-2 are enzymes that are part of the prostaglandin and leukotriene metabolic pathway, which uh, we had a little bit of a introduction to in the chapter on lipids, uh, but COX-1 and COX-2 are involved in pain perception. So aspirin and some of these other drugs um, suicide those enzymes, okay? And by suicide or killing those enzymes, they really halt the enzyme. So there's no dissociation because the active site is blocked literally by a covalent bond. Okay, antidepressants, monoamine oxidases, some of those are also very good suicide inhibitors working at the nervous system. All right, so a couple of summary slides here. A competitive inhibitor, let's recap common Y intercept for the line reader Burke plot. Apparent V max is equal to V max. Apparent KM has gone up. Competitive, uncompetitive inhibitor, excuse me, uncompetitive inhibitor, parallel lines. Apparent KM goes down. Apparent V max goes down. Mixed inhibitor, we're dealing with the non-competitive special example. The dissociation constants are equal between the inhibitor and the enzyme and the inhibitor and the enzyme substrate. With that equal dissociation constants, uh, what happens is that we have a common x-intercept. So apparent Km is equal to Km. The apparent Vmax has actually gone down. And this is a pictorial diagram of all the different types of inhibitors. Hey, don't forget inhibitor here, competitive, inhibit here, uncompetitive, Finally, non-competitive, we inhibit at both sites. These are the corresponding line weaver Burke plots.